Hi everyone, welcome to All Things Iceland, the place to get the inside scoop on Icelandic nature, culture, history, and language. My name is Jules and today I am going to be going deep into how to move to Iceland from the United States. This is a topic that many people have requested and it's one of those things where it took me a bit of time just to kind of gather information. This video is of course meant to be helpful but is not legal advice nor am I a lawyer nor am I planning to ever represent people or you know guide people along in the process like filling out paperwork or anything like that. But I do think that if you are seriously thinking about it or even just kind of like going over your head if, if Iceland is an option for you if you're coming from the United States that this video will for sure be helpful. That's kind of the whole point is that back in the day when I was looking into how to move to Iceland, a video like this didn't exist. And I don't even know if there is a video currently on the internet that talks about this just because it's a topic that can be very layered. And for that, that's one of the reasons why this video might end up being quite lengthy. But at the same time, I will have a ton of resources in the description box. So even though this video will give a lot of information, a lot to digest, you can go in the description box, check out links to the Director of Immigration and all of those places that I'm going to be referencing where you can find out more regarding what might work best pertaining to your particular situation if you're moving from the US to Iceland. I am, of course, super excited about this topic uh, because there's so many layers to it, like I mentioned. And in order to make it easily digestible or just kind of a little bit more organized, I'm kind of splitting up the video into two sections. So the first section will be all about what you need to consider, what you really need to keep in mind before actually moving to Iceland. Because coming from the US, it's not just so easy, unfortunately. There are countries that are in the European Union, EEA, EFTA members that have it way easier than if you're outside of those areas. And even though I'm saying specifically to the United States, meaning like the people who live there and, and kind of talking to those people, this information might be helpful to those who are just outside of those countries that I, mem that I mentioned that are part of those um, packs or part of those agreements. So. Just keep that in mind, it's not that this is solely <laughs> potentially helpful to the people from the United States, but at the same time, that's where I'm from. I'm more familiar, at least in the process of being a person from the United States, moving to Iceland. So that's why I'm talking, or at least gearing this video towards that audience. However, I don't doubt that you'll find, if you're from somewhere else, find useful information here. The second section will go over the different residence permits that are available. And there are nine categories of them. So of course, I'm not gonna go into every single one, but there are three major ones that many people end up using when coming from the United States. So those are the three that I will focus on in this video. However, like I mentioned, there will be links in the description box to the other types. So you can check those out, see what works best for you. But there's a good chance that one of the three that I'm going to mention might apply to you. If you're finding my videos helpful and you're enjoying them, please make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on more videos that are around topics like this. I really am trying my best to hear what my audience wants to learn about and then create videos around that. In this video, I will go in a little bit about how to find a job in Iceland. For me, it was quite a process and there are many different ways and things have evolved here in Iceland as well. So I will provide resources for people who are looking into finding work here. Before I jump into the video, I have just a special announcement that I wanna share because I am so humbled by it and so grateful that this has happened. And in an essence is that I received an award and I have it right here. It's an equal rights award from the town of Mosfetsbyd where I live. And every year they provide an award to individuals for recognizing them for something. And this year, uh, in terms of for equal rights, I've been doing a lot of work on the podcast. I've been doing work obviously on YouTube 
trying to share perspectives. I mean, some people who are watching this video might know about my Being Black in Iceland video that I did some time ago. Also, I've talked about Hans Janoten. But the podcast I've been working to elevate different voices uh, from foreign nationals and people who are Icelanders to talk about experiences, specifically when it comes to diversity, when it comes to fighting against racism. And I just feel so honored that my town uh, felt that the work I've been doing is of value and decided to present me with this award. I, like I mentioned, I'm just so grateful, surprised by it. I didn't even know this was, I had no idea this was happening until like last Friday. So I just wanna say thank you to everyone who watches and helps support this work because I feel like it is really important. It helps to keep me encouraged, to keep doing it. And I also am just grateful overall, just for the opportunity to be able to share those stories of individuals and to explore and learn so much about Iceland and to be able to share with people. So yeah, thank you. And, and now I can say that our podcast is award-winning, which is pretty cool. And lastly about this award, it was made in Ausgarður Handverkstæði, which is a store or a workshop here in Mosfetspæði where people with mental and physical challenges go to work and they make things out of wood and other materials. So super cool. All right, so let's just jump into it. And of course, we're starting with what you need to consider before moving. And I have multiple points here. But first, I think it's really important to think about cost of living and salaries in Iceland versus the United States. On average, the salary in Iceland is pre-tax around $60,000. Obviously, that will vary depending on what type of job you're doing and things of that nature. If you're in a position, say in the United States, in tech and you're really specialized, you might get way more money. If you're coming to Iceland and you're planning to work in a restaurant, obviously that will be a different amount, a smaller amount than if you're specialized in something. So that can just depend. And it's interesting to look at the average salary in the United States, which is somewhere around $48,000. And this is of course taking all of the United States into consideration. Same thing in Iceland, taking all of Iceland into consideration. Very different places. <laughs> and you might be thinking, oh wow, salaries in Iceland on average are higher, but cost of living too in Iceland I believe on, on the whole is quite higher than in the United States, especially if you're coming from a place where you can rent an apartment for, let's just say for your one bedroom for $800 in the US. Now I'm from a big city in the US, specifically New York. So that is something that I, I've not ever found. <laughs> uh, maybe depending on the neighborhood, I mean, it just, might depend, but in this day and age, I don't believe that that's the case. Most people will be sharing a room and that too needs to be factored in. So even if pre-tax you're getting that amount of money, taxes are quite a decent amount here. They can range from around 36% to up to 46%. And this is, I'm rounding here because it's 46 point blah, blah amount, 36 point blah, blah. But just to give you an idea, taxes can, take away a decent chunk of your salary, but in my opinion, they're worth it because they're going towards helping to subsidize healthcare coverage, paying for school, essentially different parts of helping the society here so that we have a really good quality of life. And regarding like a salary that I've had, I don't really even think about the taxes part. I just know that this is the amount that I'll be getting each month and that's how I live my life. I don't think about pre-tax, but that is something really to think about in terms of your income and the type of lifestyle that you want because consumer prices also in Iceland are quite a bit higher here than in the United States. Food is imported, a lot of it, um, like most of it, and that can cost a lot. Even food that is produced here can cost a decent amount. You have to think about the fact that if you want to go out to eat at restaurants, if you're not a person that likes to cook that much, then you'll be incurring a lot of costs. In Iceland, it's definitely much higher to eat out. You could easily pay $20 for what would be considered like fast food. And then if you want to eat out at a more fancier place, that will 
continuously rack up. And it's just, it could be a lot. If you like to drink, alcohol is very expensively here. It's heavily taxed. When it comes to driving, if you plan on driving a car, buying a car in Iceland on average is more expensive than in the United States just because of different taxes, like importing and things like that. And also paying for fuel. So a gallon of gas here is about $6. It's, it's more than that, but it's around, you know, if, I, if I'm just saying a number, but still $6 a gallon, that's, that's a lot, <laughs> right? And you have to factor all of that in to, okay, if you get a job, you find a job and it pays this certain amount, and you want to live uh, by yourself, let's just say. And I, I found an apartment that was downtown, meaning as an example, downtown, one bedroom, one bathroom, kitchen, all that. And it's around 200,000 ISK, which I'll have the change in terms of what that would look like potentially in US dollars. The currency rate fluctuates a lot here, so just FYI. Uh, but still, that is something you need to consider. And that wasn't even in necessarily the heart of downtown, but it was close by, like you could walk to stuff quite easily. This, in my opinion, like I mentioned, is so important for you just to understand how you would be able to afford living in Iceland because for some people it is quite expensive and they end up having roommates because they want to live downtown or maybe they move farther outside of the downtown area. We live in Mosfetspeid, which is 15 minute to 20 minute drive outside of downtown Reykjavik and we love it here. There's lots of nature <laughs> and it's not as expensive. Things are changing as more buildings are being developed and like, people are coming to these areas, but for the moment it is still very much more affordable than living in downtown Reykjavik. And then if you live out in the countryside, that's a totally different cost. And I went to Isafjordur, which many people are aware of, and house housing there, like to buy a house is very different, but still like way less expensive. So it's just really good to learn about that and what type of lifestyle suits you and would that be feasible depending on cost and salary if you were to move here. Another thing to consider regarding Iceland is the weather and weather and seasons together so it ends up being that of course Iceland is a place that is really beautiful we see like the great photos of beautiful mountains and green moss and waterfalls and sunshine there's a whole lot of photos with sunshine in them <laughs> and a lot of time in Iceland is raining and so to not be honest with yourself about that and the fact that there could be months where it's raining a lot, where there are intense windstorms, where there are intense snowstorms. This last winter was brutal. We had so many snowstorms. We had people getting stuck in the snow, cars that had frozen to the road. And this was not like that far out of town. So this is a very turbulent place when it comes to weather. And a lot of that has to do with the Gulf Stream kind of bringing up this warm air and with it, even though it kind of makes Iceland's weather not as intense as you would assume, like meaning not as cold, there's still a lot of turbulence that happens with the weather. And I have been in some storms that I'm just like, wow, this is pretty scary. I could feel the house, you know, uh, shaking a little bit. And the houses here are built really sturdy, but still the wind was just like, pushing hard <laughs> and, and that in my opinion can have some effect on how you feel it can potentially affect your mood so that's just something to to think about in the darkness in terms of the long days in the summer that's amazing we have like 24 hour brightness for some people that is difficult because sleeping then becomes harder they're trying to wear, you know, the face mask and whatever else, but it can be annoying to them. But then in the wintertime, you're having very little sunlight in comparison to the summer. Really long, dark days. And the shortest day in Reykjavik is four hours. And if you're going to live outside of the south southern area, say like in the West Fjords where I was, they don't actually even see the sun for two months, meaning like the sun doesn't come above the mountain. The sky can get brighter, but you don't physically see the sun shining on you. 
And that could be hard for many people and tons of snow and whatever else. In Reykjavik, like I mentioned, when it comes to winter in other videos, I've talked about the fact that it could be really icy on the sidewalks. So having micro spikes and just preparing yourself because winter is long. <laughs> and what is considered spring here is basically, in my opinion, still winter, but longer, brighter days. That kind of what marks like spring is on its way or spring is here is because the days are <laughs> getting much brighter and longer. And a crucial part to me when it comes to Icelandic weather, at least on the physical side, is knowing how to dress for it. This is something that I had to learn. I did not come prepared with all of the equipment, all of the gear, and I, I'm saying like just clothing, like certain types of raincoats that work well, don't use an umbrella that does not work well, especially since it will more than likely be windy. Snow boots, micro spikes, all of that stuff. Layering clothing. And for whether you're gonna be a person who lives here or you're an individual that's just planning to visit, that's why I created the ultimate packing checklist for Iceland because I believe that many people are just not aware of how much the weather can vary. And to be fully prepared means that you can have a better time. You can enjoy Iceland more if you feel like you are dressed appropriately. Like with layers, you can put them on and take them off. And with appropriate layers, you can stay warm enough. And I feel that that's super important. And the ultimate Iceland packing checklist, of course, is um, it's free to download and there will be a link to it in the description box. So definitely check that out. And if you haven't visited Iceland before planning to move, I very much encourage you to do so. Mainly because, like I mentioned, there's different seasons. And in my opinion, there's two main seasons, summer and winter. So visiting in summer is sometimes really nice and sometimes it's it sucks for some people because they just get total rain and windstorms but visiting in winter for sure is so important i remember my first winter visiting and granted visiting does not at all equate to living here but you can very much get some sense of it uh even if it's just a little piece that it could be intense beautiful but still intense. And even though US citizens can visit Iceland for up to 90 days at a time, this does not give you the permission to be able to legally work and live here. You're basically a tourist traveling around. You don't need a visa for that. And I wouldn't jeopardize, you know, your potential status later on. If you were to come within that 90 days, that was specifically for being a tourist and trying to work. And you, of course you can go on interviews and potentially snag a job, but there is for sure a process and I will go through that when it comes to the residence permits that I talked about earlier. So just FYI. So there are two more things in this section that I want to mention and the first has to do with finding out what it's like to live here from foreign nationals. So of course since you're watching this YouTube channel you might have already watched some videos of mine that talk about what it is like to live here. And on my podcast as well, the All Things Iceland podcast, I interview different people from other countries. I interview people who are Icelanders about a variety of topics. Many times when the person's from another country, I always talk about like their coming here, what drove them to come here, how they've adjusted, any advice they have for people who want to move here. But on top of that, there are individuals in groups like foreigners in Iceland or moving to Iceland that you can go and join and ask questions, find out information, get to know a little bit more from someone else's experience what it's like. Does that mean that your experience is going to be for sure like theirs? No, obviously not. Everyone has their own unique life and lifestyle and whatever else but I do believe that getting some insight is helpful you have to take a big grain of salt with it of course I have been very fortunate I've been really loving my time in Iceland I've continued to feel like I'm progressing and being creative having a great time getting to connect with people like yourself through YouTube and the podcast and whatever else so you know my experience might be and will more likely be very different than yours depending on I think attitude depending on circumstances that has a lot to do with it for sure for me the way I see my life in Iceland has to do with it's like this big adventure it's just so much fun there are challenging times let's just be for real 
but like I mentioned, if you look into these groups and you talk to people, you might hear people who are having a horrible time or that people that end up leaving just because this was not the right place for them. Taking into the account too, if you're a very social person and you care about making deep relationships with people who are Icelanders here, you might find that to be a hard time. It's not impossible. I have friends who are Icelanders who are not part of my family, meaning like my Icelandic family that I'm married into. And I feel really fortunate and grateful for them. At the same time, I've heard from some people who've moved here and they have not been able to create those types of deep relationships because Icelanders are known to have childhood friends that they grow up with and they end up keeping in those types of circles. So they not always is open to having friendships with other individuals that are outside of that circle. Sometimes even in Iceland itself, meaning like to other Icelanders. So it's not just, you know, something that foreigners could face. Other people who are born and raised in Iceland and maybe, you know, want to change friends groups, it might be difficult for them. I actually, you know, want to dive into that a little bit more with talking to other people about it, but it's just a possibility and you have to kind of get a sense of what Iceland is like to some degree, of course, by visiting and then hearing other people's experiences. The last part of this section has to do with if you're planning to work here, which many people are, then understanding if the job that you want is in high demand. Meaning if you want to work in a restaurant, if you're going to work in tech, if you're going to work in marketing, are jobs like that available? Are are companies in Iceland looking for people to fulfill those? Obviously there is a pandemic going on right now and a lot of people's jobs have been affected by that. So the unemployment rate is quite high, especially when it comes to jobs that have to do with travel and tourism. It's awful to see this mainly because obviously there was so much work and a lot of people were moving to Iceland to work for these companies. I initially moved to Iceland in 2016 and got a job with a tourism agency. And that's where I was for two and a half years or so until I ended up moving over to an advertising agency. So you really just need to search and I'm gonna provide some resources for that. Specifically, there's a website called Working in Iceland and that is in the description box below. They have some articles about working in Iceland. I don't know how often they update this, but they also have one page that has a list of different places where you can search for jobs. On top of just finding out if your job or what you can provide in terms of work is in demand here, you also need to know if it's necessary for you to speak, understand, and write in Icelandic. Some companies are absolutely like, you have to. This is the company culture, we do all our meetings in Icelandic, everything. And there are other companies where they make exceptions because you bring something of so much value to them that they're like, we get it, you don't speak Icelandic, we would like for you to learn. I've not been in a company yet where it hasn't been encouraged and it's something that I take seriously, even though I have to do it a full-time job and then do it you know, on the side essentially. But it is something that I feel is important in terms of integrating into the culture here. But in terms of finding work, this could be potentially a deterrent for you or it might not matter. So if you're a computer programmer and you wanna work for CCP, for instance, I'm just throwing that out there. There are people who work there that don't speak Icelandic because they bring something of value to this company that they're like, whatever, <laughs> you know, like, it isn't a necessary part of the job. But if you're going to have to meet with Icelandic clients and doing customer service, let's just say, um, for a certain type of company that caters to Icelandic people or people who speak Icelandic, then you more than likely will be expected to know, understand, write, and communicate well in the language. So super important just to keep in mind. I remember I was looking in 2015, some of the jobs, like one give dead giveaway that <laughs> it wasn't that important for me to know Icelandic is if the job had been printed in English, right? So that's like, <laughs> it's like, oh, okay, well, that's good. But there were jobs that were printed in Icelandic and I still applied for them, even though I had very, very limited Icelandic at the time. I could tell like colors and say my name and stuff like that, but and say like my name is or whatever. However, I would still apply because if I felt like I could bring value to that company, I was willing to take that shot. Sometimes I didn't hear back from companies and I had to do my own follow-up work 
meaning like get the person's email or find out who might be like HR in the company, send them an email, see if they're already processing applications, things like that. It's, it took, and I'll just be for real with you, seven months from when I started looking, like really putting my energy into it until I landed the job. And then I ended up moving to Iceland after that. So this could be a long process for some people. It could be a very short process, especially if you just happen to chance upon something that fits what you're doing. I was really adamant about when I moved to Iceland, and this is an agreement that Gunnar and I had, which I talk about in a previous video, that I was more than happy to move to Iceland with the condition that I got a job, I secured a job before moving because I, been in a career in digital marketing, I was not willing to just start over. For some people, it doesn't matter to them, they're willing to start over. For others, it's not the case. And I just made my choice, Gunnar was supportive of that, and we worked to find something appropriate, and it worked out. So I just say, keep hope alive, it is possible. At the same time, it's a lot of work, and a lot of time, <laughs> and nothing's guaranteed. So the second section of this video has to do with residence permits and those types. As I mentioned, there's nine categories, but the three main ones I'm going to be talking about have to do with family reunification, if you're going to apply for a work residence permit, or if you're planning to study full time. The others can vary from planning to be an all pair, if you're planning to do missionary work, if you're going to volunteer, whatever. But for the most part, what I hear about in for people who are coming from the United States are those main three. So that's why I'm focusing on them. And these are specifically listed by the Directorate of Immigration in Iceland, also known as Utlendingastofnin. So I will of course have a link to their website where you can read a lot more details about each permit and I encourage you to do that. I also encourage you to reach out to them if you have questions about these different residence permits and whatever else, looking at the applications just because obviously that's their specialty. <laughs> and there will probably be questions that I cannot specifically answer. Regarding family reunification, so it has to do with if you're a spouse of a person who's legally allowed to be here or a cohabitating partner of that person. And when I say by legally allowed to live and work here, in essence, it means a person who is residing in Iceland not just an Icelandic citizen. So if you were from one of those member states that I mentioned, EU, EA, EFTA uh, countries, you and you come to live in Iceland, you can legally reside and work in the country. So much easier for you to do that. And if you had, let's just say a spouse or a child or something like that, who's from the United States, then that person could apply for one of these permits. So my husband is an Icelandic citizen, but if my husband had just been a permanent, had just had permanent residence or just had a resident permit, you know, then I could technically still apply, but it's linked to how long their status is in the country. So that does provide some potential issues, especially if you are no longer with the person and that changes what type of permit you should have and all of that jazz. When it comes to the family reunification, as I mentioned, there's spouse and there's also this thing called cohabitating partner. And this is a partnership, not in that like, oh, we just live together as roommates, but individuals who are in some type of relationship. They call it partnership, obviously, to be PC um, <laughs> because it can be able to encompass many different types of individuals who could be in relationships. So the difference though from a spouse and a cohabitating partner is that in both, in both cases you have to be 18 years or older, but for a spouse I have to show that we're married, so a marriage certificate. And also I can show my own support, meaning that I su can support myself or my husband or whatever spouse can be the person who shows support for me. In terms of a cohabitating partner, you have to show your own support, so it can't be linked to the cohabitating partner, and you also have to have shown that you had cohabitated for at least a year together before this application, or at least that's what it says on the website. Children who are 18 years or younger can of course do family reunification. If you have a parent, who is 67 years or older, who lives in the United States, 
and you're legally allowed to be in Iceland, that person can apply. And just to kind of clear that up a little bit, it has to be that the person who's living in Iceland is an adult child <laughs> of this person who is 67 years or older who wants to apply. But then they have like different application for a person who's a parent of a child that is under 18 years old. So it's, it's really interesting. They have to segment them this way, but that's just how it is. And lastly, for family reunification, if you are a family member of an EEA or EFTA citizen, which I already kind of mentioned. So those are at least what you need to think about if you're going the family reunification route. I've met plenty of people from the United States who have gone this route, meaning like they had started a relationship with an Icelander in the US and they ended up coming here, either they were married already or just cohabitating and people with children, meaning they had an Icelandic partner and the partner moved back to Iceland with the kids and then they decided to come over as well, even though they're not with the Icelandic partner any longer. So your circumstances can vary. Just to give you also a little insight on my experience uh, with the spouse residence permit, I didn't need to get a work permit because of that. So because it was linked to me being married, I then could you know find a job and whatever else, but I could be in the country with my partner who could in essence be supporting me if I didn't have a job, and that would be totally fine. Whereas in the next type of residence permit that I'm gonna go into, a work permit, this obviously is solely based off of that. And the company that you're planning to work for obviously has to get involved too in this paperwork. So that means that they're essentially like sponsoring you. And that's just something to think about because now I wouldn't say you're at the mercy of the company, but it, it is in essence like your ability to be in the country is linked to this company. If you plan to move to another company based off of a work permit, then you have to go through that process, of course, again, of getting another work permit and yada yada. So regarding the type of work permits that are available, one of them has to do with if you have some kind of special knowledge, as I mentioned before, maybe if you're like a programmer or like myself, I had special knowledge around digital marketing and it's very possible that I could have just come to Iceland on a work permit, but that wasn't my initial reason for coming to the country. So it made sense to me to, to stick with the marriage one. But that's just something to think about. If you don't have any ties to anybody here and you have some special knowledge, you can do that. If there's a shortage of workers in some type of field and needs to be fulfilled. Now, just to be completely honest with you, there of course can be a shortage of workers in an industry, probably not right now because of the pandemic, but a lot of the times employers will pick people who are from those countries I mentioned, like EEA, EU, EFTA countries, because they don't have to do much of anything. Those people could just come here, live, work, it's super easy. So unless there's something that US citizens can do specifically that has to do with the shortage of workers, then, you know, I would say more than likely it's not gonna happen that way. But you never know. I mean, this could end up being things spin around so differently in the world. Another type, which is super interesting in terms of work, has to do with athletes. And athletes have definitely come from the United States. Some of them are playing football, which is known as soccer in the US. Some are playing basketball. There might be others doing other sports that handball, I'm not sure, I don't really think handball because that's not as popular in the US, but still professional athletes who are coming to work here, that does happen. So if you're really good at a sport and are looking to go pro or, or are already pro and want to work in Iceland, that's maybe something to look into. And the last one in this work category has to do with qualified professionals on the grounds of some special contracts or some kind of collaborative work. And that of course can vary, but let's just say maybe this would be a person who's a lawyer and is doing some kind of special work. You know, there's, there's many different potentials there. So it could apply to you. As I mentioned, it will be linked below so you can check it out if it makes sense uh, or if you qualify for that. But it's just kind of interesting the different types of work permits available. To get this permit though, you have to have already found the job before you're putting in your application. Like applied, found the job, you know, the company has, is willing to vouch for you and then you go on with the process. The last of the three, which I know of many people who have gone this route, has to do with studying slash 
continuing education and of course that means people who are going to be studying full-time at a university in Iceland, people doing postgraduate studies, exchange students, interns, graduates who are looking for employment and meaning graduates who graduated from some university in Iceland looking for employment because they are they do give you a window for how long they allow for you to be on an education slash study permit before it's like before that potentially expires so that's something to keep in mind i've learned of many people who have come that route to iceland meaning they decided to go and study and then once they were done they found a job or they met a person or whatever and decided to stay one really crucial thing about this type of permit is you still have to be able to show you can support yourself so people of course take out loans or whatever else but it's not like you could just come here on this permit go to school full time and try and work as much as you can to support yourself. They actually limit the amount that you're allowed to work while you're studying to 15 hours a week, which is for most people not enough to sustain them. If that's if you don't have savings or if you don't have loans or if you don't have a person who is a benefactor and you know <laughs> providing you with money. So, and this applies like I mentioned when you're just in school, when but believe me, you're taking breaks, you're allowed to work more. However, it can just be complicated and that's just something you need to think about as a student is how you'll be able to support yourself. Which leads me into the next part of this, which is getting into when you're going to apply, what does support look like? Like what are they asking for money wise to show that you can support yourself? So I'm going to be, as I'm talking about the numbers for support, because this comes from some data from 2019, I might look down because I'm looking at my laptop just to have these numbers, right? But for an individual in Iceland to be able to show that you can support yourself is amounted to 189,875 ISK, so Icelandic Krona, per month. And if you're a couple, then that equates to 284,813 ISK per month. This amount of money, it's not just like you can have one month, you need to have many months already secured so this can vary in terms of how you get the money like being a fulbright fellow which there are people who for sure get that for iceland you can have taken out loans maybe you have an individual that dumped a bunch of money into your account to show that you have that support and allow, you know, allows you to have that or maybe you just have your own savings and it just works fine just that way so there's many different ways but they do want to see that and it's necessary for the application if you're not in a position where say like with a spouse that you can just show your own support another way too is one thing that i showed for my support was the actual contract for my job before i started so i wasn't that money wasn't already in my account but it had been agreed upon between me and the company i was going to work for that this is how much money i was getting a month so that made it super easy for the director of immigration to say like, oh, okay, yeah, we know that they're going to get that money. No problem. That's part of their application. So one thing that shocks a lot of people that's a part of this application, especially for first time and specifically for people who are doing it for the first time, is when you're planning to move to Iceland, you're not immediately in the healthcare system. That takes six months. And I'm specific specifically speaking about people from the United States, like I mentioned, people from other countries, I can't talk about that. I can talk specifically about my experience and how it worked. And you have to buy insurance that covers you for up to six months. How I did it was from an Icelandic company and I believe that's what they recommend doing anyway. And it's in essence to protect you. If something were to happen, an emergency, if you need to go to the doctor. But after six months, you are then rolled into the system. So part of your application for the first residence permit is that's super important is that you have to do that. But as I mentioned, after you've lived here for six months, easy peasy, don't have to worry about it anymore, don't have to pay for insurance that's outside of the system that's already set up in Iceland. So just keep that in mind. In terms of how long it takes to process these applications, ordinarily they were saying that it was around 180 days. As many of you know, we're going through a crisis right now because of the pandemic and Things have changed a lot with the director of immigration in terms of processing times. I know that they have moved dates saying like 
you know, for people who haven't already been approved for their residence permit, we, you know, it's, you're legally allowed to be in the country if you came on this day and whatever else, and if your application's already been in, yada, yada, yada. So FYI, uh, it can be quite stressful now to be able to do that. I know people who applied as students who were desperately waiting and they couldn't even enter the country from the US until their application had gone through and they got a special inf like paper or notification they would legally be allowed to come here. So yeah, different times now. Hopefully we'll be able to go back to a point where this isn't an issue, but um, that's just the way the world is at the moment. So just take that into consideration. And as you can tell, I'm not going in line by line every part of the application, but once you do get approved, that's when you get what's called a Kenetala. So you're gonna get a resident permit card, of course, but you're also gonna get this ID number. It's like your national ID number is what they call it here, but when you compare it to the United States, it's your social security number. It's very different, as I've talked about in my eight strange habits of Icelandic people, your kenitala is something that you actually share with a lot of people and you use it in many places. I know that is essentially taboo <laughs> in the US and it took me a little while to get used to just like telling people my kenitala, like no big deal, but that is something you need when you go to the doctor, you need it to get paid, you need it for many different things. I mean, it keeps track of you in essence and different things that you, you're doing in the country or associated with or signed up for or whatever. And of course you absolutely need it. So once you get your Kenitala, that's great because then you can open a bank account. You can do tons of things that are totally necessary, but also it lets you know that you're official. <laughs> so it's a good feeling to have. And I remember when I got mine, especially just getting my card, it was just like, whew, now I feel like I can relax. Specifically because I couldn't get paid until that happened. So obviously it's super necessary to make sure that all of your documents for your residence permit are in order if you can the first time around so that it can get through as quickly as possible and you can end up settling into Iceland. If you are moving to Iceland with any ties or an individual to help you with that, of course housing is going to be something that's important for you to find. <laughs> and if you've been doing the application from abroad, you will then need to have like secured that housing on your own. As I'd mentioned before, taking into account the cost of living here and salaries and all that jazz. On top of that, I have some links to different places where you can look at the cost for housing and just kind of decide like what might make sense for you. One thing that I think it's important to mention is that affordable housing in Iceland is something that is in huge demand and there isn't enough of it. <laughs> so if that's something that you're hoping to find, you could get lucky, but also it might go very quickly just because there are so many people who are looking for an affordable place to live. Airbnb, and this is kind of a little bit of a side note, but Airbnb, during when there wasn't a pandemic and there were tons of tourists coming to the country. That was something that was dominating a lot of apartments downtown and keeping people who were living in the country from being able to actually live downtown because it just drove up the prices of rent, of buying and all that jazz. Of course it was really difficult for people living here because it just feels really unfair. I don't know if any of those rules will change after the pandemic However, I do know that many people have moved to the outskirts of the Reykjavik area just to find more affordable housing, like I would mentioned. Many of the places listed are in Icelandic. However, there are groups where it's put up in English and I'll share like those groups that are on Facebook if you want to check them out and get a good idea of what things potentially cost and depending on where you want to live, how much space and all that jazz will make a difference for sure. So I've shared a lot of information in this video about how to move to Iceland. If you found it helpful, interesting, and or other things, please give it a thumbs up. Please share it with other people that you think would find it interesting or helpful for them. That is definitely the reason for this video. I appreciate you sticking around to watch this whole thing. I very much love doing this, even though it takes a lot of energy and <laughs> research, but I know that it can be helpful for many people. And as I mentioned, it was something that I wish had been around when I 
was moving here or at least even thinking about moving here. So I just hope that it helps to give people a base of information to build off of. I also really enjoy being able to provide content on the All Things Ice and podcast. And as of this summer, I created an All Things Ice and community on Patreon. And there is where you can help to support this channel. You can help to support the evolution of All Things Iceland. You can also get exclusive content about Iceland that I'm not putting on any other channel. I do Ask Me Anythings every month. I do live chat groups every month. Every Friday I do Folklore Friday. So lots of fun stuff that's being done there that you won't see anywhere else. And I have such a blast with interacting with the members there. So you can check that out. And if you decide to join, I would love to see you there. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next one.